I'm Betsy Ziegler. I'm the CEO of 1871. And we do tech talks almost every month of the year. We shoot for the second Thursday of the month. We take off July and December. And they, we, uh, the topics uh, change every time. And uh, hey, Erica, welcome. We're just getting going. Um, the topics change every month. This time we're focused on food tech. I'll talk more about food tech in just a second. Um, we find these tech talks as an opportunity. We bring experts to you. I moderate a discussion. We go as deep as we can on a theme. And then it's a lot of Q&A with the audience. And so we have a, a pretty small audience as of right now. My hope for is that you guys are excited about engaging with this group and that we'll um, kick around a bunch of ideas together and maybe sort of have a, a smaller cohort cohort discussion as we get going here. Uh, food tech, um, on Tuesday of this week, we announced our Food Tech Innovation Lab at 1871. It's running in parallel with our supply chain innovation lab. So two themes, two different tracks, two different sets of participants. But as many of you know, there's lots of overlap between food and supply chain. In fact, tons of overlap. And the nature of these uh, labs are they run for 13 weeks. Inside of those 13 weeks are four immersive weeks. Two of the four weeks are 100% virtual. Two of them are hybrid. And they end with a, a, a culminating summit that brings together companies across the whole maturity curve, as well as uh, venture capitalists, uh, academics, other experts. So if you are building in the food space and are interested in being part of the lab, the growth we, um, the minimum group in is growth companies, which means you have to have at least some customers, some revenue. Um, we will probably have 40 or 45 in the lab. We'll have later stage companies and corporates participate. Um, there's no fee for the growth stage companies to participate. And the goal for you, for from our perspective for you, is to get <laughs> to cash and contracts is our goal for you. Um, we have an entrepreneur in residence dedicated to the Food Tech Innovation Lab. He is one of our panelists tonight, Nate Cooper. In a minute, I'll have him tell you his story and introduce himself, and you'll understand why we've asked him to be um, our entrepreneur in residence. So um, I'm going to get going here and introduce our panelists. I'm actually going to do a very, very light introduction and, and really give them some time to tell their stories. And we've got We've got three founders, three entrepreneurs. Nate has has done that in his past. Now he's in, in venture capital. He'll tell you that story. Um, both Erica and Disha are building companies right now in the food space. Um, uh, all three of these people are very dear friends of mine, and I'm excited to, to have them on stage. So thank you, um, Nate, Disha, and Erica, for, for participating. Um, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Um, so, Disha, let's start with you. So, Disha, when I started 1871, Disha was on my team. She was she was one of the, the senior members of my team, and she left to go start a company. And uh, so, I want you to I want you to like you've got three, four minutes, five minutes if you want it. Tell your story. What are you building? What problem are you solving? Where are you in your journey? Um, that whole the whole the whole shebang. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Betsy, for having me. And I'll be remiss if I didn't start by saying it was 1871. And um, that actually set me on the path for entrepreneurship and here, here market. So I'll always be appreciative of that. Um, but prior to that, I actually worked for a company called Mandalay's International. It's one of the largest snacking companies in the world um, and focused on global analytics for the organization. So I come from a CPG background. So kind of being in food tech was a natural uh, next step for me. Um, so I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Here Here Market. And Here Here Market is an online marketplace that connects chefs and food entrepreneurs to consumers nationwide. Seems like a very 
niche um, specific creator community uh, to serve. But there's a little bit of a story in terms of why um, we thought Here Here Market was the right marketplace uh, to connect what we call the culinary creator community with consumers nationwide. So when I left 1871, it was um, just a shade before the pandemic. Um, and I was working with a uh, large food distributor um, called Gordon Food Services on a very different business problem, which was to help restaurants with group dining. We launched our MVP in February of 2020. And then in March of 2020, the pandemic happened um, and group dining became illegal. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the, the business uh, came to a grinding halt uh, literally overnight. Um, but in that time, we have built a ton of relationship with restaurants that had signed up to, for the MVP with us. And all of these restaurants, we all know the story, started to hustle um, and figure out how to diversify their revenue streams while dining room operations were closed. And a lot of these restaurants and chefs actually immediately got to work building incredible, incredible product. Um, and when I say product, I don't mean ready to eat meals. I mean, you know, shelf stable spices, pasta, snacks, granola, whatever have you incredible incredible product but knew very little about how to take it directly to the consumer um, or how to build a retail presence around these amazing products that they were they were building so that's why we built here here market um we wanted to amplify the talent and the uh wonderful diversified products that these um creators and chefs were building and connect them to not just their local audiences um in their communities where they own restaurants but to audiences nationwide. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about me and here, here market. Look forward to chatting more about the-, the before, I, before I transition, where are you? So tell us where you are today because you've made you know significant, you know, you've got lots of customers, you've got, you know, you've got real traction, um, maybe just, you, you mentioned a little bit, but can you kind of paint a picture for where you are today? Yeah, so we've been, uh, since the pivot, we've been in market for 20 months. Um, and in that time, we have become the largest online marketplace for Chicago-based culinary creators. We have 180 culinary creators on the platform who have launched 800 products with us. Wow. Um, and we have consumers nationwide. Um, I, when we initially started the marketplace, Betsy, we thought we were creating this hyper-local marketplace where chefs in Chicago and consumers in Chicago wanted to connect with each other. Turns out Chicago has a, a, a spectacular national reputation for food and more than 50% of our sales actually are national. So wow. our consumers literally um, are come nationwide, but a lot of them come from small town America and suburbs where people don't have access to a whole foods or specialty stores or great restaurants. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks to chef. All right, next up, I want to introduce Erica. Erica Beth Levin is, uh, she's a founder as well. She was, she is the first female founder ever at 1871. 1871 is 11 years old. So Erica has that distinction. This is company number three, tech company number three, I think, right, Erica, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so can you welcome, are you in Florida right now or are you in Chicago? Where are you? I am, I'm in Florida right this second, uh, but I'll be back in Chicago in, in two weeks. So in two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe give people a little bit of backdrop of your, of your overall founder story and then what you're building with global, what, you know, what problem you're solving and again, where you are in your journey. Perfect. And thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to, it really is an honor to be here and after 11 years kind of doing it again, um, but being able to sort of come home is really nice. Um, so my name is Erica, and as Betsy said, this is my third startup, uh, two that I've grown as the founder, um, and one where I was one of the first employees for a, a venture-backed uh, restaurant technology uh, platform. Um, but my first company uh, was really a couple years out of college, an online magazine for women in Chicago. It became um, the number one online resource for women there, um, and we covered a lot that had to do with food. Um, restaurants, what to do, where to go. And we evolved sort of with the, the audience and um, started 
covering more uh, lifestyle content as well. But it led me to also write about food for NBC and many other publications. And until two years ago, I was still a, a food writer um, working actively for a bunch of publications. And then um, after that, which I ran for about eight years, I moved on to be one of the first employees and to launch the Chicago market for, uh, it was called Reserve. And actually what's so funny about Reserve is I was at 1871 when I found out about the job. I don't even know why I was there. It was beyond <laughs> my cheeky days, but I remember sitting in there. Um, so did that. Um, it was really interesting. That was my first time at a venture backed startup, as I mentioned. Um, it, it, it was very uh, fast paced, uh, late nights, but really exciting. And they ultimately sold to Resi. And then I had a real job in between there uh, where I had someone else paying me a salary for a while, which was nice. Um, and that led me to conceptualizing global, which was also um, during COVID, Disha. And um, it just global is an internationally inspired baby and toddler food company, introducing kids uh, to texture, flavor and spice, um, to culture from around the world through food and to allergens um, so that we can hopefully help mitigate both picky eating and food allergies in kids. And that was very much inspired during the pandemic when I had a child who was starting to eat food, real food, not just uh, milk or formula or whatever. Um, and we couldn't leave the house. And I wanted to be able to bring the world to, to her. And I also didn't want another picky eater. Uh, my first child, I was very hesitant to give him texture, flavor, and spice. And so he was very picky. Uh, so with the second one, I'm like, you could have some coconut curry as your first food. You'll survive, I think. Uh, and she did. And now she's a really, a, a really great eater. So um, we, we, one thing I'll say is, uh, about the company too, is, you know, people don't realize that kids actually do have a flavor window between four and 18 months of age that where we can most easily influence way, the way that they eat forever. There's no reason why baby food needs to be sanitized or dumbed down for kids. And it's not happening anywhere else in the world. Um, and elsewhere food is just called baby food is just called food. It's not called baby food. Um, and, and those kids eat, you know, diverse and wonderful flavors and they're 10 times less likely to have allergies. So um, where we are in the journey is we are technically um, doing our first uh, production run next week, actually. It's next Tuesday. So we were cooking in a commercial kitchen in Chicago. We sold out of our first run, which made us realize we needed a manufacturer. And so that's what we're doing next week. And um, we'll be fulfilling orders for a bunch of grocery stores um, that have ordered from us along with our direct-to-consumer platform and the people that have pre-ordered on our website. That's amazing. Congratulations. And you've got a couple of... Um, grocery stores that are ready to accept you when you're ready to go, right? Yes, yeah, a bunch actually, more than expected. Um, but I think the good thing about it is it's not overwhelming, but it's it's enough that we're really gonna learn a lot of lessons. Um, but with some of these chains that are 10 stores, 13 stores, 15 stores, I feel like we can really understand, you know, what we're doing from a marketing perspective to drive sales and, and volume. And that way we can replicate it as we grow instead of, you know, getting too big too fast. So. We're excited for the learnings that are going to come in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Cool. Thank All you. right. Nate, Mr. Nate Cooper was one of my students at Northwestern at Kellogg. So I've known him for, for a while, longer than I've known both Disha and Erica. Nate, um, long history in food. I'm going to let you tell your story, but founder, co-founder, founder, restaurant tour, family, venture capitalists, right? The whole nine and, and will be our, or is the entrepreneur in residence for 1871's Food Tech Innovation Lab that we just announced on Tuesday. So Nate, do you want to tell us your story? Sure. Thank you, Betsy. Um, so my story, my family has been in and around food for over the last hundred years. And despite trying to get out many times, I keep getting pulled back in and here I am. Uh, so the legacy businesses were in packaging uh, and value-added produce, and actually the generation before that, uh, my great-great-great-grandfather was a salmon fisherman, so it goes back even longer than that. Um, my history as an entrepreneur starts about 15 years ago. Uh, I helped start a restaurant chain called Life Kitchen, uh, and we ended up owning and operating the stores in Chicago. Uh, and then almost 10 years ago, I said, if I spend another day in food, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Uh, and decided to go back to Kellogg uh, and, of course, started another food company. Uh, and thanks to Betsy uh, for letting me graduate because uh, the business kind of took off. We started a business called Wise Apple, which was essentially if Lunchables and Blue Apron uh, merged. 
Uh, business grew incredibly rapidly, scaled a few million dollars in revenue, raised a bunch of money from top tier venture capitals throughout the country. Uh, and then sorry for another time, we signed a term sheet with two large strategics. Uh, and six hours before funding, after six months of diligence, uh, our lead pulled out and left us with a massive legal bill and essentially bankrupted us, which is a wonderful experience. Um, but here I- Let's just pause listen. on that for a second, because unfortunately, like you're not the only person that's ever had that happen, but just that, no. you know, you're, you're like, everyone's excited, ready, because your, your co-founder also, another Kellogg student, who know, many people know well, and then they just, just, didn't, yeah. just chose not to wire. Um, yeah, and it went from, you know, at the time, honestly, like worst possible thing you can imagine. And now I say it's probably the best thing that ever. Um, and so I looked in the mirror, um, and I was getting married in a few months, uh, unemployed and said, what in the world am I going to be when I grow up? Mm -hmm. Um, and wanted to take a break from food. Um, and finally had a chance to sit back and sort of look at some deals that I had seen. Uh, and five and a half, six years ago, I uh, had the CEO, or I called my wife and I said, hey, um, having this guy over for dinner. Uh, and she said, what do you mean you're having a guy over for dinner? Uh, and I said, I'm looking at his company. Um, and she said, well, you don't have a job. How are you going to invest in this company? I said, I'll figure that out. Uh, and it was the CEO of a uh, idea at the time, which is now Olipop. Uh, and I'm, it's the probably the fastest growing beverage of all time. Uh, and then started investing kind of full time. Um, and sort of became known as one of the guys with food. Uh, and so we've been fortunate to back a lot of incredibly impressive operators, entrepreneurs throughout the world in and around food um, and raised a fund of close to $25 million. Uh, over the past year, uh, all of our LPs, our executives, family offices, operators kind of throughout the food industry. Um, and the way we sort of view the world is from a 10,000 foot view. Uh, our food ecosystem is massively broken uh, and there's truly a multi-trillion dollar opportunity to fix it. And I heard a great quote from uh, Andrew Zimmern today, the um, TV chef personality, who said, if you take away food, there's blood in the streets. You know, revolutions have been happened over food. Wars have happened over food. Uh, it is the one thing that every single human being on the planet interacts with at least three times a day, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, and it is truly, in my opinion, the most underfunded vertical in all of venture capital. Uh, and so I'm excited to be doing what I'm doing. Yeah, very that I love it. Um, and it, it's, it's given the intros that we heard from Disha and Erica and where they are and they're, you know, what they're trying to build with like, and the, and the funding market, right. That is, um, sort of shines a, a different kind of spotlight on on the opportunity. Let's just stick for a second on, on what venture in the food space looks like. Um, uh, Nate, you tweeted the other day that there was a, I, I'm probably going to get the tweet wrong. I don't have it in front of me, but something like a, a company with no product in market had like a hundred million dollar valuation or something that was in the food space, right? But yeah, that, that, that's uh, pretty. I mean, in, particularly in this point in time, you don't have to name the company, but like very rare, particularly in this window of time, but also in this in this vertical, correct? Yeah. So, you know, the problem with, you know, venture is a world of a herd mentality. Right. And so if you look over the past five years, first it was crypto, then it was Web3 and NFTs. And, you know, now it's AI, right? And people get excited. The big funds get excited. They pour money into these companies. And then everyone else in venture has a lot of money to deploy and they just start putting money into it. And with food, um, and if you're a founder and someone comes and says to you, hey, I'm going to give you $20 million at a crazy valuation, you know, on paper, you're then worth some obscene number. When in reality, it really makes absolutely no sense. And I think what a lot of founders fail to realize is that these crazy valuations um, inevitably, while they're sweet and you know ego boosting, they cause a lot of these companies to fail. Um, and so, you know, there are companies that will call themselves food tech, right, and get some crazy valuation, 
Um, but in the reality, all they really are is they have an innovative recipe and they still have to sell a CPG product, right? Um, and if you can't sell that CPG product, this doesn't matter what technology you have. Um, you're still just a product and you need to sell that product to have a real business. And so I think um, a healthy sense of reality, you know, people in, in all businesses, I think, should try to build for, you know, non-billion dollar outcomes. Uh, but especially in food and in, you know, CPG products, because it's really hard to build a CPG product. You know, it's even harder to build a food tech company. Um, and if you look at, there's a, you know, it's gone viral a few times. There's a market map of like the eight or nine different food companies that own all the CPG products in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and these companies most, you know, year for years and years, they came and acquire income companies earlier and earlier. And nowadays, you know, I've talked to many of them and they said, we're only going to acquire products that have a path to a $300 million, you know, platform. Right. And so if you can't build that and they don't, they don't see that, then you have to become self-sufficient on your own and you can't rely on venture capital or an acquisition. And so getting to profitability earlier, um, I think is more important now than it ever has been. So Disha and Erica, as you listen to that, does, does that resonate with you, Erica? Obviously you're building a, a CPG, Disha, you're a marketplace um, that has certainly has product, but you're a marketplace. Um, what, what are your, you, you've both been fundraising, you've both been in this, you know, tough time of, in the market to uh, to raise what are your any reactions from your own personal experiences to what Nate just shared? I mean, I I can go. I think Nate's right. It's super hard to build a CPG product, and I believe what is broken for nascent CPG brands is the distribution channel. Um, and we went through this period this seven to 10 year period where you could if you put in enough um, venture capital, you could build a viral brand uh, from direct to consumer um, and you could hope to capitalize on that. Um, I believe that opportunity window has closed and the jury's still out if those brands were ever really profitable to Nate's point. Um, they got big, uh, but perhaps not profitable. And when the venture money dried up, the, either the brands failed or they're now looking at traditional um, channels. Um, so I think Nate is, you know, uh, bang on in terms of building for profitability um, and not building for maybe hockey stick growth, which is what the VCs demand, uh, especially in a kind of CPG space. Um, but that said, I think we still need to, and Erica can probably attest to this, like fix the distribution channels for, for these nascent brands. So they actually have a shot at building um, profitable small companies. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons why we resonate so well with our chef and food entrepreneur community is because our, distribu our distribution is cost effective and not cost prohibitive, which is what the typical channels are. But that said, we also have to brave the cold, you know, direct <laughs> consumer winter that <laughs> that we're in right now where cost of acquisition has gone up tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the theme of distribution in a second, but Erica, uh, anything oh, else you want to add? Uh, I was just going to say, I think my, you know, I've, this isn't my first rodeo, I guess, in business, but it is with CPG. And so um, I've surrounded myself with some really strong advisors that have either done this before um, for a startup or for major corporations. And the way I've been advised and what I've been working towards is, as Nate mentioned, profitability, but also just really good margins from the get-go. How can I increase those? How can I um, 
just set up my plan to know we're going in that right direction because otherwise nothing else really, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Um, I don't know at what point we'll hit profitability, but we're, we're working at that top line revenue. Um, and that's why I think for us, like geographically um, launching and seeing how plans go in each of these kind of smaller test markets uh, is, is a helpful, helpful strategy. And one thing I'd say to Disha too about the cost effectiveness, when I was with Reserve, um, we were going up against open table. I mean, our job was to try to take down open table. Um, it, it did not happen. Um, but ultimately, you know, open table costs a lot of money. Um, it costs a dollar. Most people that book on the open table don't realize it costs everyone one dollar reservation per person. So your table of four costs that restaurant four dollars, and that ta- that three hundred fifty people that you sat that night cost three fifty. Um, and if you take advantage of that. Uh, prime time tables, it's even more, it's like $7 a person. So we went in with that same uh, goal, right? To be operator friendly, restaurateur friendly, um, and ultimately provide a better product that was more cost effective. Um, so I, I, that strategy, I mean, it, it definitely helped. We were able to sign up some of the top tier restaurants, but we were never able to get um, those really small restaurants or any of those chains. It just never happened for us. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to talk to Dish's uh, statement yeah. about kind of being more operator friendly and, and providing, you know, options. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't have any idea about the cost structure on the back end for for uh, most people. Table. Yeah, most people don't. So what I would say as someone who's most most of my friends are in restaurants, call the restaurant. It shows us as booked on open table because they want you to call uh, because it costs them nothing. So yeah. anyway. All right. I will do that. Shout out. I, I, I thought I was helping them. I didn't know I was hurting them. No. Um, no. So on this theme of distribution, uh, what when when and Nate you talked about it and and just you talked about it um, and Eric a little bit like what does fixing distribution mean like what what is the if you, if you were to paint a picture of an ideal end state what would it what would it look like? So I can talk here um, in the world of natural products it's sort of a two-sided marketplace where there's the distributors and the retailers. And on the distributors, there's historically been two options, right? There's Holt, there's UNFI and KE. Uh, I'm going to try not to name anyone who poke the alligator in the eye. Yeah. And then yeah. the retailers, you know, there's the foods, the um, Fresh Times, the Sprouts, it's, you know, Wegmans, Air One, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the middle, you have these emerging brands. And to Dish's point, the way the distribution model has historically been set up is, you know, these massive um, distribution partners, the bigger they get, the more that they cannot profit off of these small brands. And so what that results in is chargebacks uh, and dispute resolutions and things like that. And it's gotten to the point where I am looking at a company right now whose go to market strategy is dispute resolution management because these companies literally hire an entire person, at least one, a lot of these companies to dispute, you know, to manage their dispute resolution, right? And $200 million companies do it all on Excel and phone. And I was talking to a friend yesterday who runs a nearly hundred million dollar brand. Um, and you know, they launched a new product line in one of the top three or four retailers in the United States. And I said, how's it going? And he said, it's going great, but the problem is we're in like, we've been in a six month fight with them over disputes. And so we're not doing anything new because like it's a, he said, she said, you know, classic duel. And so because of this whole problem, we invested in a company that was in certain Chicago a few years back called Pod Foods, which has had a bunch of success, which sure. helps emerging brands um, launch with sort of, um, you know, these emerging retailers. The problem is, you know, at the end of the day, it's a brick and mortar distribution logistics business, and there's nothing harder to build. And despite all the success they had, they're going against, you know, these 800 pound gorillas in the room. Um, and so that, in my opinion, is what's broken about this distribution world. Um, Nisha, you can probably add. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear from the other folks. And then I would like to get to some sense of like, okay, if it were like what what would it take to fix it? But before we get to what will it take to fix it, Disha and Erica, anything else you'd add on like the context of the distribution problem at hand? I can speak to it, uh, Nate, as well because of the um, requiring distributors really to to get into any of these grocery stores that we want to, even some of the smaller ones. One of one of our um, 
new stores only has a couple locations, but are requiring us. I can't even go in my car and drop it off, right? So I'm required to spend, you know, a part, a good chunk of that margin on the distributor. Uh, one, they're clunky and very hard to onboard with. Uh, and the, Nate, this is my personal experience with Kehi, right? And, and UNFI, not Pod, but um, it, it's it's a complicated process. It's a lengthy process, and they take a good chunk of money. Um, and yes, I have already been warned uh, for months and months and months to have somebody on staff or to be able to hire another company that's just at the ready to help with these chargebacks and disputes um, because it's such a big part of our business. I have somebody who is another CPG brand that's on paper and everything looks great, but they are telling me that they can't deal with these disputes anymore. And it might be the end of that business simply because of something like that. So it has to, it has to be better. Um, there have to be other, other options, but right now it's like a necessary, it's like a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I have any, any more um, color to add in terms yeah. of the issue, but I think the innovation also needs to come from um what are some alternate channels, right? Like, you know, do we only have to go in is success for emerging brands, only large chain grocery stores, or are there other more innovative distribution channels? And that's something, even though we're exclusively online, we're constantly thinking about. Um, and and it, it is an omni-channel world, right? So how do you, what is the most kind of optimal combination of on and offline that we need to create? And lots of opportunity there if we can crack that now. Yeah. Um, so if you if 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 you were to roll the clock forward and let's just let's just pretend it's three years from now. The challenges are bigger than that. I know it's longer than three years, but just like and and you got to to describe an ideal um integrated set of systems and structures and and frameworks that made this work like what would it I, I understand some of the problems that you talked about already but like what would it look like how, how would you describe it what is the perp what would be the like a ideal vision for an answer i mean distribution would be less expensive right that's that's the that's the like the headline, right? Why is it so expensive to get? And and here's the the funny part, Betsy, is that um, small and emerging brands, so brands that that have done less than a hundred million dollars, less than a billion dollars, they're called like hyper small CPG um, brand category, have grown two times the size of a Mondelez or a Kraft Heinz or whatever else. So there is a demand for it a demand that far exceeds the demand for Oreos and you know mac and cheese and, and, and things like that. And and consumers want, and this is, you know, Erica's kind of thesis as well, consumers want it, but there is a a some cost effective platform, oh hear here market, is is missing to convene the 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 supply and demand, right? So and that innovation can take many, many different um, uh, forms. And and to me, like what I was saying, what's exciting for me is I think we can find the consumer outside the grocery store as well. Yeah. It's about where where are they living, where are they playing. It doesn't have to be like it. It can't just be a zero sum game between grocery store or online. I see what you're saying. So you're so you're so when I say like how to fix it, you're saying there's the there is the, the like the the big pipe that goes into the grocery store. We yeah. need many alternate alternate pipes. You call them alternate channels. I, I'm trying to visualize yeah. the same thing to reach people that allow the consumer to get exposure and access to new and interesting things that they might be energized by at a an appropriate cost. That also doesn't overwhelm the cost structure of the yeah. of the producer. Yeah, and the consumer, by the way, is willing to pay a premium, right, for these. Um, niche brands um it's just a matter of finding the the right product for the right consumer it has to be done at a national level because when these brands are hyper local it's the the audience that is not large enough my two cents yeah i'm i'm i don't know if i'm less optimistic about this this issue but like i totally agree with it that you need the, the only way it's going to change is if the retailers and distributors businesses legacy businesses are threatened because it's almost this mafia type business where you have this pay to play 
you know, shelf stocking fees. If you don't pay me yeah. immediately, you know, fifteen, twenty five thousand dollars per shelf per SKU. Uh, and then they don't have to pay you for 60 days. And like the brands are their hands are tied behind their back and one eye is closed. Right. And it's just until their business is threatened, they're not going to change the way they operate. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Um, nothing is in favor of the brand. Right. Absolutely nothing when it comes to working with distributors. Right. We need them. They seemingly don't need us, but they actually do. If we all went on strike. They'd have nothing to sell. Um, but but it's it is really interesting. And it kind of is akin to my story about open table. Restaurants feel like they need open table because of the marketing value you know, that it provides. Like, oh, if you can't find me on Open Temple, you're not going to go, right? You can't find me in, in, on kahe.com or, you know, or whatever the back end is. I don't have a brand, right? Whole Foods doesn't know about me or Air One or whatever doesn't know. Um, so it's, it's definitely um, set up to feel like a requirement, but it's not a, it's not friendly for the, for the brand. And so to go back to Dish's point, like, it should be less expensive. It should be more convenient. It should be less clunky. Um, it should just be made easier because quite frankly, without the CPG brands or whatever brand it is, stores don't, I mean, they don't exist. So to make it friendlier for all would, would feel pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, great. Awesome. Thank you for that. I want to change gears a little bit and I want to, I want to talk about, so um, your own companies notwithstanding, right? So like, I want to talk about what your what things that you're seeing from a, innovation lens in food. So not here, here and not global for a moment, just for a moment, put them to the side. Um, what are the most interesting, most exciting things you're seeing that, that uh, on anything it could be an actual product. It could be about the, the chargeback process. It could be, you know, what's, what's, uh, what do you say? Wow. That's a, It'd be really important, really interesting. For for me, it's it's truly the food innovation. We're starting to see um, modified diets have started to become more mainstream than ever before, like gluten free and keto and low FODMAP or whatever were very fringe concepts, maybe even five seven years ago. Yeah. Um, but the consumer is getting very hyper focused on what's on the label, um, what their kind of relationship with food is. And it, it is really interesting to see the innovation that's happening in this food as medicine and, you know, kind of diet drivers, whatever you want to call them. There's so many terms out there. But um, that to me is exciting where, and it kind of even goes back to what Erica was saying, like the, the grocery store, the, I think the grocery stores are going to feel the pressure because the, you know, the, the same kind of box of mac and cheese is not going to resonate with, with, uh, with the masses as, as it did before, because they're going to look for something different. So mm -hmm. to me, that's kind of exciting to see. And the diversity of flavors, that too, uh, I think there's a lot of innovation happening in, in that space as well. I mean, notwithstanding what Erica's doing, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, to me, it's kind of food is medicine and, you know, very interesting niche brands coming out to meet very specific needs. That's exciting to watch. Yeah, that is one of the three primary focus areas of our food tech innovation lab is the ingredients, nutricycles, that, 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 um, that category. So that's, um, you know, not the new version of an Oreo, but the new version of salmon. Like the you know salmon that isn't salmon or whatever it might be. Right. Um, cool. Uh, Nate, Erica, what's on what's on your short list of shiny things that you're energized by? As Disha said, I um, food innovation has been amazing. Global flavors and and all of that, seeing that front and center. I'm really in, and I also. Uh, I'm into these, this health is medicine sort of thing um, as well. And these adaptogens and all this, this cool stuff, which I don't quite frankly know if it works. I've tried them, but Hey, someone tells me I'll feel good or be less stressed. I'll give it a try. Um, but I do think food can, can, can very much help with health matters, but um, sustainability for me is really important. Um, I like seeing you know, food waste. I like seeing alternatives. Like I pitched last week with a company that was doing, you know, to prevent, uh, to, to basically, 
cut back on meat. They integrated mushrooms into their patties. And um, I pitched with somebody else that, you know, was making sure all of the food waste, you know, is used for something else or what MycoCycle is doing, you know, mushrooms are eating trash and turning it into treasure. That's yep. really exciting. And, and you know, by ra I'm raising two little kids in, in this world, like, they're very passionate about, uh, and maybe because I, I don't mean to scare them, I'm just trying to teach them, but, you know, leaving the world better than we found it and making sure it's still around in 50, 75 to 100, whatever years. Um, so I think, I, I think also, by the way, sustainability is a requirement at a lot of retailers now. If you don't have some sort of sustainable element, they won't even look at you, at least the kinds of stores that we're, you know, looking at. Um, so I think kind of the, the better for the earth, the sustainability, that's all, um, I'm happy to see how much there is out there. Yep. Uh, I think Nate. For, yeah, I think for me, the two areas I'm really excited about, you know, in addition to some of the exciting stuff happening in brands, um, would be the future of packaging uh, yes. and sustainable packaging and ingredients. So on the ingredient side, you know, the perfect example is wheat, right? So before the war in Europe, nobody knew that 40% of Europe's wheat came from Ukraine. Yep. War started, supply chain was clogged, and all of a sudden everyone's a global ingredient expert. Uh, there are other ingredients around the world that are more subject to supply shock, war-torn countries, uh, climate change, et cetera, like coffee and cocoa. And so I think there's going to be a lot of exciting innovations there. Um, packaging, I think, is, I think, the most underfunded space in the world, in my opinion. Um, if you look at it, it's a trillion-dollar-plus industry. And if you read any Fortune 500 annual report, it says, you know, they have a whole section on what is our commitment to the future of packaging, right? The problem is that none of these companies actually do anything until A, there's either laws, which will then play with lobbyists, or B, um, it doesn't have a material effect on their bottom line, right? And 99% of all future packaging companies are going to cost more. And so until there's ideas and innovations that are at price parity and easy to implement, um, We've made a couple investments in that space. Um, there's not going to be change until there's loss. Uh, and I think those are two of the incredible uh, verticals that we're talking about uh, that are really interesting. To me. Yeah, great. Well, and pack as you know, packaging and uh, is going to be another one of the focus areas for the food tech lab, which is um, which is cool. You mentioned that you mentioned the kind of government or regulatory it showed up. It actually came up earlier in the conversation too. What is the role, like, is, are there opportunities for the government to be um, more help? It's kind of a silly question because the answer is obviously going to be yes, but maybe I'll ask for like specifics. Uh, more helpful in, in, in creating space for innovation and driving change that kind of like helps the world be better versus protecting, uh, you know, the big and the existing processes. I understand there are lobbyists. I understand there's hundreds of millions of or billions of dollars invested in that. But like, what what could what is the what could the government do? What are the opportunities on the regulation side that could unleash more positive change? I think you look at things like they did with the EV tax credit, right? Where they encouraged consumers to go and buy electric cars, and I don't know. I'm not in, I don't have an electric vehicle. Um, hi, Chase. Um, I don't have an electric vehicle, but that probably spurred millions of electric vehicle, vehicle purchases. And so they do a lot of things with subsidies to farmers and what crops they're growing and things like that. Um, you could implement, you know, I'm not an economist, uh, you could implement tax breaks for sustainable packaging. Um, there are a lot of things you can do. The answer is that they don't act. You know, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean in the next 15 years, which is the craziest thing to ever imagine. Um, you know, I, when I was in business school, I went on a trip to uh, Southeast Asia, I think. Uh, you know, I went to Bali, right? I was very fortunate to go to Bali on a trip. Uh, and I was expecting this pristine environment that I grew up, you know, reading about and seeing pictures of. And I was blown away at the amount of trash that was on the beaches there. Like, it was one of the most depressing things I've ever seen. And that's going to be America and the United States, you know, the next 15 years of 20 years, if we don't make changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> Disha or Erica, anything else you want to add on that point? And the, um, I'm going to go to um, a, um, a chat, a question in the chat, if not. 
Oh, okay. So Tony uh, Thomas is one of the, an 1871 member building a company in the food space. Um, uh, Tony, maybe a little bit later, we'll give you the opportunity to tell them what you're, what you're building explicitly. But his question in the chat is about changing the environment. It says, we hear there's a move towards value brands in terms of consumer demand. How does that play out for the very crowded premium market in the midterm future? Um, and then he says, labeling is a big part of that also. Uh, I, I guess I could speak to that. So um, I, I was actually just speaking about this today. So 90% of all sales go to like the basic store store line where only five to 10% go to premium products, right? So like they're already that that's been for a while. So how do you kind of capture that five to, you know, five to 10%? And uh, Tony, I think you mentioned labeling. I, I'd love to hear what could you clarify what you mean by labeling helping in that department? Or I don't know if they can speak. I don't know. If Tony, do you want I, I think you can come off of mute. Tony, do you want to come off of mute and just ask directly? Sure. So, uh, sorry, that was a comment to Nate's last uh, point when we were talking oh. about how the how the government can affect it, you know, labeling, particularly oh, 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 oh. in terms of greenwashing and all those kind of things. Uh, the FDA has a has a hand in that as well. So, sorry, that was the comment. No, no, that's okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, no, I so so anyway, only five to ten percent go to the premium brands. However, there's still a market for those premium brands. Frontera, you know, just sold for what almost two hundred million dollars. It's a premium brand, and they were going up about, against what is it, Pace and Tostitos and things like that. So my advice is, or the advice I've been given, which I can now dispense, I suppose, is like, how do you get as close to those prices, right, as possible while still establishing yourself as a premium brand because you have the qualifications to be premium, whether it's organic or non-GMO or sustainable packaging or whatever it might be. Um, so it's actually something I'm I'm working on actively right now. Again, it's, it's throwing back to what I said about um you know, margins as well, right? We, you have to establish the business to have good enough margins for you to be able to at least get close enough, you know, to some of those price points um, so that it's not, you know, a $10 bottle of a jar of baby food, you know, it might be five or six, but it's not 10. Uh, so I don't know if that helps answer, but that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Erica, would you kind of add to that, you know, building your own offline audience that you can then convert at the grocery store. So you're, in your case, it would be your own kind of mom population that you're nurturing through your site or through activations that you're doing more locally, regionally, whatever the platform is. Um, that was a that, thousand percent. Who to look for that brand? Yeah, a thousand percent. I mean, I could go on and on and I, I will try not to, but, you know, basically establishing ourselves everywhere that a parent already trusts to shop, right? If they have a trust with their corner bodega, their corner specialty store, the coffee shop or whatever it might be, you know, how do we establish ourselves there so that, you know, they already trust that that store, that retailer is, you know, giving them, um, you know, good options. Uh, obviously growing our online community. I was talking to a VC um, a couple of years ago um, about, how one of the, ba the a baby food company out there with a very high valuation has built a sense of community on their website, right? So it's not just going to the site for food, but it's going to the site um, for a sense of community and to go to a brand that's now establishing themselves as some sort of parental experts in other in other topics, not just food. And I think you know that sense of community uh, is really important. And how do you build that? And you know, there's many many different ways, and you could. Many marketers will tell you many different ways to do that, but I agree. If you can get them, you catch them before they get on into the store. Although there is something to be said about someone just pulling it off the shelf, um, but if you can get them before that point, it's 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 a really good thing. And that's actually exactly what we're trying to do by by launching geographically and getting into all these stores that people trust or being on here here market where people are going for more premium products, more small batch products, uh, locally made, and things like that. Great. Are there other um, other questions in the chat? If not, I will go. I will ask a few more on my end. Just check here. Okay. So, um, presumably, some of the people in the in the audience here are are other food entrepreneurs. Tony's one of them. I know for sure. I don't know everybody else in the in the chat. Uh, sorry, in the in the session here. As as entrepreneurs in this space and as investors in the space, what advice do you have for people that are, are thinking about entering in, recognizing it's a massive category that they could be solving any number of, of uh, different kinds of problems, but any particular advice from 
from the three of you as as uh, these folks start uh, kind of get started? I'll give some high level blanket advice. Um, this is kind of what I tell all entrepreneurs, regardless of what you're selling or building. You know, you could have the best idea, the best product in the world, uh, and if you can't tell the story, then it doesn't matter. You know, in my opinion, storytelling is the most important trait that a founder and entrepreneur can have, whether it's fundraising, selling, hiring, um, you name it. I think you really need to be able to craft and tell a good, solid story around whatever it is is being built. Uh, and I think that's hands down the most important trait any entrepreneur can have, regardless if it's food or software or well, you name it. Yeah, it's recruiting. You needed to recruit the team, to recruit the money, to get people to build the customer base, all that, right? It's kind of covers all the elements. Yeah. All right, Erica and Disha, what would you say? I, I think for me, um, I would say like really study the market. And when I say the market, I just don't mean your industry. I mean, draw analogies from other industries. So wh whatever it is that you're doing, even if it's the first time in a particular industry, it's likely been, you know, emulated somewhere else um, in a different form. And bringing those insights into what you're doing, I think is, is, is very powerful. And a lot of times I think entrepreneurs get so um, insular in their thinking in a way that I'm building something that is so new and so innovative that isn't a comp out there um, that I think we miss out on many opportunities to learn from people who are better to fail, so on and yeah. so forth. Outside the industry as well. On that front, and I I, um, I don't know if it's, a, uh, I hear small children, which I love. I love small children. If they, all the panelists have small children, so it might be any number of your children, or it might be somebody in the audience. If it's somebody in the audience, let's mute yourself. If it's the, any panelists, it's totally fine. Um, uh, you all have, Disha has a three-year-old, Nate has a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Erica, you have a tiny one who we just saw your daughter and then your son, Charlie, like my son, Charlie, he's a little bit older, but um, they're all welcome. They're all welcome. Um, Disha, when you think about the analogy and you think about the marketplace that you built, like what, what give us, can you give us an example of analogies that you might've thought about um, with respect to here, here? Yeah, so the, the one thing we didn't really talk about is the the back, what well, the front end, for example, we always talk about this, you know, the world of kind of, you know, um, kind of one size fits all marketplaces is starting to wind down. Um, it, yes, there is like mass category, multi uh, um, mass market uh, marketplaces like Amazon. But uh, what we're seeing success in is when you go to a marketplace for sneakers, when you go to a, a marketplace for crafters, Etsy, if you, you know, uh, cameo for celebrities or um, whatever analogy, only fans for, for other people. Um, so it's, so we're starting to see niche marketplaces and that's kind of the, the, the learnings we're drawing from other industries with niche creators that we're, we're putting towards the front end. And then on the back end, what we're truly helping is helping these food entrepreneurs or chefs launch new products. And this might be something new and innovative in the food space. We call it restaurant to retail, and that's a new concept. But the pharma industry, for example, is also starting to do this, where companies are coming up to, to give pharma industries, uh, phar pharma companies, a jump start in you know drug development, right? Because that's such a long process. So companies are popping up to say, hey, how can how can I jump start or accelerate your new product development? So we're starting to you know, draw some analogies from there as well, and which is like two such different kind of spaces to work in. And when you think about the creator there versus here, it's, it's, it's apples and oranges, but you know, there are insights to be had um, and, and learnings and, and actually neat learnings because no one else in your industry is kind of looking that far out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Thank you for that. Erica, what advice would you give? Oh my gosh, I'm still in it, right? So I would say um, before I started this, I had really zero knowledge of just like the retail business, the trends in grocery, other than I had I had more intel on, on trends in restaurants. I, I remember writing a trends piece a few years ago about like, what are the big food trends um, to expect 
the next year, maybe it was 2019 or 2020. And what I realized though, in doing a lot of that research is that restaurant trends trickle down into grocery, right? Like avocado toast was on every single restaurant menu, you know, in America. And then all of a sudden you go to the grocery store and you see avocado toast flavored potato chips and you see vacuum sealed avocados so that you can make your own at home. Um, so just following the trends, and I know Disha said other industries as well, of course. Um, for me, I knew global cuisine was pretty much all over the grocery store and trending very hard at that point because I had immersed myself in the research. So that's the other thing I'd say, whatever your industry is, um, really learn what the publications are, the blogs, the industry, you know, the, the trade publications and things like that and, 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 and immerse yourself in it. It is really important. Um, so I had known that gross, uh, global food was trending. And, and then I also realized it just wasn't touching baby food. Right. So, you know, tacking on to the trend, but in a new way, um, at least that's kind of how I launched it. Um, but I would just say really following, you know, what's going on in your, in your world, in your industry, um, staying, staying well versed in it, really surrounding yourself by an excellent uh, group of advisors, right? People that have more industry knowledge than you do. I mean, the head of Gerber of North America just signed on to be an advisor for me. I mean, I can't, it awesome. doesn't get better than that. Yeah, right? that's awesome. Former head, it would be a conflict if it was current. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it, fair enough. Yeah. But still, yeah. But you know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, and it takes time to get to those people, right? You don't have to go to that person at the beginning. Go to go to somebody who's building a small brand, but maybe it's a year ahead of you. Those are some of my strongest advisors, honestly, or startup founders that are about a year or two ahead. And Disha knows a lot of them because <laughs> they're probably all on here, here. Uh, so those that would be my advice. It's just really knowing your industry researching and staying up to date on it and surrounding yourself with people that that know it really well. How do you ask somebody to be an advisor? Um, thoughts on that? I, I mean, yeah, that's a, gosh, that's a good question. I think a warm intro always helps, right? You know, if, it, if you're referred to somebody by someone they already trust, that's really great. Um, integrating yourself into communities like 1871, right? You're bound to run into people and there's already kind of a sense of community and trust. Um, I went through the Techstars program. Uh, people ask me why after being on my third startup and, you know, and I, I tell everyone now I learned more in 13 weeks than I did in 13 years. And I thought I had a strong network just being in this business for a long time, but it was nothing comparative to what I have through Techstars. So, you know, join these groups, join these organizations, um, get those warm intros from someone that advisor already trusts, and then they have to buy into what you're doing and to you as a founder as well. Um, so really build and nurture that uh, relationship. Great. There's a question um, before we get to the, the question in the chat. I do want to just ask Nate one question, which is when you look at your portfolio, how would you like what? what sets the the super successful or the likely to be super successful companies apart and then how do you work with your portfolio companies to give them the best chance of success what like what talk about what barrels approach is um so rarely you know rarely are we ever the largest investor um yeah we rarely take a board seat you know our approach is i'm not going to be your largest investor but I'll bet blood, sweat, and tears. I'm going to be your most value add because, like, this is the only vertical we play in. All of our LPs are in this space, um, and I've been through the ringer, like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mostly yep. the bad and the ugly. Um, and so that's kind of our approach. Um, I think what what sets the great companies. I, there's a great quote which I think applies uh, to a bunch of. No great company has ever um, failed to surprise us on the upside, right? And so, no great have, company. Sorry, say again. No great company has ever failed to surprise us on the upside. Yeah, and okay. so like every massive company, you know, every big success ends up being exponentially more successful than anyone ever imagined, right? So like, obviously, we're very well known for Olipop. When I sort of, you know, five something years ago was thinking about whether or not we we're going to invest in this, um, I said, look, it'll be a home run if they get to X dollars and six. Um, they have four X that in their fifth year, right? Which is just the craziest thing I've ever seen. I think, you know, that and some of the others in our portfolio, it helps when you're going after a big market, right? 
Um, it helps when you're, it's easier to go after a big market or to make a twist on a big market than to create a new market. Um, if you can decrease the friction around something uh, and make a painful process or product easier or make something that people enjoy a lot better for them, right? If you look at, a, look at Uber, look at Google, look at all these companies, right? Uber is literally just a taxi business, right? And they made it easier for people. Olipop is a soda business, right? And they're making something that people love that they kind of hate to love, but they're addicted to better for them, right? Um, Starbucks just kind of upped the experience on coffee. You know, a lot of the successful businesses throughout time are making one small step change to make an experience or a product have less friction, better for you, a better experience, you know, very few products create new industries. Um, most very successful businesses are like a small twist in making a product sort of one degree higher. And that unlock is what makes these products have just this escape velocity. Mm -hmm. Can I tack onto something Nate just said? And it's it's slightly a different, a different direction, but you mentioned the um, Uber, right? It's no more than a taxi service, right? Now, also going back to Tony's question about the premium brands, right? Uber launched as a premium brand. It was a black car service, right? It was not for everybody. Yeah. And what they did was they proved they had proof of concept, right? They had enough people that could do that. So imagine what they could do if they went a little downstream. And I think the same can be said for premium CPG products. You know, I don't, I don't know, right? It's, there's margins involved. There's lots of other things. But I, I just think that was an interesting example, um, given Tony's question about the the premium and how can yeah. you how can you start somewhere but then have mass you know have mass market appeal. Yeah, yeah. I, on Olipop, it, I, I don't know if you saw. I don't know where my Twitter feed comes from anymore because it's all different people than I normally follow. But whatever. That, put that aside for a second. There was a story, somebody posted on Olipop, they were trying to take three cans through the TSA. Did you see this, Nate? In Canada, yeah. Yeah, in Canada, yeah. <laughs> so, can I take and it? And then yesterday, can can they, they announced that they were selling on Amazon in Canada, yeah. Yeah, it's just funny. Like, you know, I need to take it in my carry-on, which of course doesn't work. All right, um, okay, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Let's go to the first one from Abigail, who uh, is at United Airlines. Um, I think she had to leave a little bit earlier. I think she she uh, signed off, but she shared it with my team. What is the aspect of AI in food tech that you believe can be scaled globally? Maybe it's what is an aspect of AI? Thoughts on that? I mean, there's so many use cases. I don't know if that is an aspect. Yeah. Um, you know, with one example to, to share with you all that we've been looking into with generative AI is um, generating product labels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's enough tech, like currently the way it's done, it's very, very uh, human capital intensive. Sit with the, with the designer, you think through your brand voice, you think through, you know, kind of what the look and feel should be. They come back with options, you pick a few and, you know, the, the process is long and iterative. Um, there is technology starting uh, to emerge out there around labeling where you put in the attributes and it kind of spits out um, a few options. And honestly, for an emerging brand that doesn't have resources to, to truly go down a very intense you know, brand development exercise, this is a great alternative. Um, we're also seeing AI use cases in photography where, you know, with your iPhone, the 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 technology is there to tell you that the light angle is wrong, or you know the this is inconsistent with like other brand images you've taken. So those are some of the use cases that we're starting to explore as we help creators launch products inexpensively. Because I mean, as we all know, with startups, where we start is not where we end. So yeah. um, so so you know, so we're trying to see how to use. Um, AI to further reduce the cost of launch. Yeah, cool. Love it. Um, I just I just typed how do you do a baby food label in, in ChatGPT and it literally just popped up a huge, huge story about what I should be doing. It's amazing. I there never thought about that. Cool. So 
There you go. I mean, I have one, but this would have been nice to know. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Um, here's a question from uh, one of my colleagues, actually, at 1871, which is uh, Erica has pointed pointed to you, um, Nate and and Disha. Though you work with um, uh, probably maybe Disha you more, just the the different uh, products you put on the the platform and how to how to help people kind of steer towards themes that they care about. But Erica, um, how do you decide which cultures to feature in your meals? And what kind of research or development process do you go through to create your recipes? That that's a great question. Um, my goal in creating this company that we that is was that we would be introducing kids not only to um, great flavor and texture and spice, as I mentioned, but to culture, um, so that they were curious about other people and other cultures and would learn very much from the very beginning. So. Um, that being said, I did some survey work and some customer discovery work and, and put out a bunch of um, possible recipes that I had sort of created in my own kitchen. And I said, these taste really good to me and my children um, and some of my friends' kids. So let me put this out there and ask for their top their top choices. So that's how we got the first four, which is a pad thai for tots, a, a tikka masala, a medi bowl, which is like a Mediterranean bowl, and then um, like a Latin bean bowl, which is sort of like a chili. Um, however, I realized to make these authentic, right, and to really showcase the world and to really, you know, um, tell the story of these delicious foods and wonderful cultures was to make sure they were authentic, um, not just a nice Jewish girl in her kitchen, you know, making veggie tikka masala, right? Um, and so I brought on a chef advisory board of, of some well-known chefs, some not that well-known, but very good at their jobs. Um, and ask them to authenticate the recipes and to make sure that they taste right and that they're authentic to the roots. Uh, and as we continue to grow new SKUs, like we're working on an exclusive line for a very large natural retailer, um, I did the same sort of research. You know, these are these are some of the 15 or so recipes that we've come up with that we think taste really nice. Um, what do you guys think? And then we were able to um, distill it down to uh, three. But to answer that question, I work with people that actually know the food better than I do. Um, and they are putting their names to this brand because they actually do believe that the food represents their culture. Great. Awesome. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> oh my God. Um, Disha, you, you know, when you go on your platform, you can, you can buy, um, products that are grouped by themes. How are you, how are you thinking about putting those different packaging options together? Yeah, I mean, we uh, we come at it more from an analytic perspective, um, which is what is search traffic look, looking like? Like, what are people actually looking for online? Um, how can we harvest that demand? Um, you know, we are a little more strategic in terms of, like, what of that demand we can harvest because, you know, some of it is very expensive to, to go after. So we actually make recommendations to our creators based on some of that analysis, some of sales data. And then what Erica was talking about a little earlier too, um, you can actually start to draw patterns on ingredients that are trending um, to, to also fuse into what is the next best product you should be launching and or what is it that people are looking for right now and if, if you uh, and sometimes it's it's even it's, you might have the, the the flavor and the product it just might be a um, an SEO thing so kind of putting the right set of words in your product description and your meta tags might be more important so uh, we don't come the, the for us if our creators on the platform good flavors is table sticks now the question is how do we make sure those flavors match with the people who are, who are looking for it mm -hmm. great. All right. I don't see any other questions in the chat. I have one to close every, every off, but if anyone else has a question, you feel free to come off mute and ask it. Um, I know this goes until six, but if there are questions, we don't need to. Uh, let's see. Anybody? Tony, why don't you just tell them quickly what you're building just so they know since they have some connection to you. Um, and Philip, then I, you, Tony, you do your thing and then Philip, I'll answer your question. Sure. Um, very quickly, we are a, um, a product discovery platform and we make basically sample sizes of uh, 
uh, stuff that's sold in larger quantities like barbecue sauce and uh, spices, like, you know, so barbecue rubs um, so that, you know, people can try out many different kinds of barbecue sauce before they buy the one that they like. The idea is to reduce food waste there. Thank Hope that uh, comes across clearly. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, Philip, are you a founder? Are you an investor? Are you a, uh, do you work at a bigger company? Who, what do you do? Where, how do you fit into the food tech space? He's a founder. I know. He's a founder. Okay. All right. Oh, all of the above. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So we should, um, on Tuesday, we announce our food tech innovation lab. So, uh, that's on the website and it's in social for us. You can, you can, um, check that out. You know, Nate, Nate also has the information, can direct you to it. Um, and people on my team are happy to follow up with you after we have a webinar coming up on the food tech lab. So we, um, hopefully you can find that information. If not, you can, uh, uh, send a note to, um, let's see on this call. I'll put a phone in the chat. Um, Stephanie Miller, it looks like you're on this call. Can I send him to you or somebody else on your team? I'm going to have you go to Stephanie Miller. Okay. So Philip, if you can't find it, send a note to Stephanie Miller. Okay. All right. I'm going to close off with, uh, well, before I do, is there anything else that the panelists, Disha, Erica, Nate, you want to mention before we, before I give you my final question, anything that you thought we should have talked about, we didn't, any closing comments about about what you're, what you're. I'll say one thing about the tech community. Um, having done it twice. This is this is not necessarily tech. We, we have a D2C platform, right? But immersing yourself in the tech world anyway, I mean, there's still components that will always be technologically enabled, right? Whether it's your D2C platform, your content, whatever it might be, don't shy away, because um, I assume most people on this call are in food. Don't shy away from involving yourself in the tech community. I mean, there's there's no reason why CPG can't be incorporated into that. I didn't even want to apply for Techstars or never, I should say I didn't even think about applying to Techstars because I thought it was only tech. Meanwhile, they invest in CPG, not all the time, but they invest in companies you know that they want to see grow. So I would just say that there's always learnings to be had and to not, um, Put yourself in a bucket that is just food or just CPG, because I think um, there's so much to learn through the tech community as a whole. Um, and you might even find ways to incorporate tech that can help grow your business. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Nate or Disha, any other closing thoughts you want to say before I give you my, my final question? I was just going to say, I, I think Chicago, we're, we're spoiled. It's a, it's a unique kind of um, microcosm of a lot of very different types of players in the food space, everything from CPG to manufacturing uh, to a you know very vibrant kind of restaurant and, and, and hospitality environment. So if you're thinking of you know forging forward in food tech, Chicago is a great place to get started and get access, not just to advisors, but to resources as well. Awesome, yep, totally agree, great point. Nate, any closing thoughts on your end? I would say more so than any industry I've ever been a part of, uh, the food community is more collaborative. And so people are willing to help, other founders are willing to help, like the worst that can happen is someone ignores you. And so never be afraid to ask. Great, awesome. All right, here's my, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, you're all, as I said at the top of the call, all friends, all people I've known now for several years, for some of you more years than us. Um, but grateful for all three of you and the, and the role you play in, in the tech community broadly and in 1871 community specifically. Um, the, my my, my go-to closing question now for panels is the following. I want you to imagine that you, it is New Year's Eve, 2023, okay? So what month? So it's uh, seven months from now. And you're, you're, you're with your your families, your kids, your friends, whoever you're with, you're, injured, you're looking back on this calendar year. What do you hope to be celebrating? I 
with this environment to stay another year in business. But, uh, but I mean, I, I would say for for us to to Nate's point earlier, not just grow, but grow on a path to the profitability. That that is what I would truly like to to celebrate. Awesome. All right. Erica? Uh, from concept to store has, will probably be about two years. Um, so what I'd like to see is us in um, one large national retailer, which we're working on now, but like seeing it actually roll out. And honestly, just really having customer support and cons consumer backing and, and people that are enjoying the product and reordering, right? I don't want people to order and never order again. So having yeah. loyal customers and to be able to launch in a, a retailer um, on, the, on the national scale. And then of course be in uh, our local stores as well. Awesome. Okay. Nate, close us out. Uh, I feel like my psychiatrist or psychologist just asked me like an unanswerable question. Uh, that's a really good <laughs> question. Um, and I'm sitting on the couch just, struggling with an answer. Um, I want to have a wonderful food uh, technology summit with 1871, obviously. Yeah. Um, for us, what do we want to be celebrated? Uh, you can also talk about, you know, it doesn't have to be about work. You could talk about, yeah. you could be like, I want to run a marathon. I know you, you're, a, you're an endurance guy, you're an endurance sports guy, so it could be anything. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so this is, I, I just have this in my head because I've been fidgeting with it. Um, this is a company we invested in that uh, is making a horticulture pot out of uh, nutshell waste, which is oh. really cool. And the company is called Nut Jobs, which is the best company name I've ever heard. Um, and I would love for them to uh, actually have a purchase order, which they're close to. So that would be fun to celebrate. Awesome. Cool. And Erica, <laughs> you're one workout in, you got seven months. You can do it. I can do that. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you, audience. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, friends. Um, great to see all of you uh, carving out 90 minutes on a Thursday afternoon in a really busy week, really busy time for all of you. Um, appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. And um, for the audience, this will be posted eventually. Uh, soon. Yeah, soon, a couple days probably. Okay. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.